Welcome and thank you for joining us uh, in the conversation presented by the New York State Writers Institute at the University at Albany. My name is Paul Grandal. I'm the director of the Writers Institute. And this is a special series of presentations that we've titled Rebuilding the Republic. These authors and their books explore the political and social forces that are demanding a serious re-examination of this nation's core democratic principles. Before I introduce today's guest, John Horgan, let me remind you that this and all of our author interviews are archived on our YouTube channel where you can watch them at your convenience. We also will post them on our website, nyswritersinstitute.org. We invite you to follow us as well on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And if you like this programming and would like to support future author interviews like this, you can go to our website, nyswritersinstitute.org, and you can find a place to make a donation. We'd be very grateful for that. So let me introduce today's guest, John Horgan. He is a distinguished university professor at Georgia State University, Department of Psychology, where he also directs the Violent Extremism Research Group. He's a native of County Kerry, Ireland, received his PhD in applied psychology from University College Cork. Professor Horgan is widely admired and respected as one of the world's leading expert, experts on terrorist uh, activity and psychology. His books include The Psychology of Terrorism, which has been published in more than a dozen languages around the world. His several other books will include a few of them, uh, Walking Away from Terrorism, Divided We Stand, Leaving Terrorism Behind, and Terrorism Studies, A Reader. He's an editor of the journal Terrorism and Political Violence. He's also a member of the research working group of the FBI's National Center for the Analysis of Violent Crime. He's the author of a forthcoming book, Terrorist Minds, which is scheduled to be published by Columbia University Press in 2022. Well, thank you for joining us today, John. Welcome. It's a pleasure. Thanks so much for having me, Paul. You, you are very busy. I mean, you're, you're involved in a lot of, of work in addition to teaching and research. Obviously, the January 6th attack, violent, deadly attack on the Capitol brought all your research to the fore. It, it's in the center of our national conversation. What did that attack tell you? I mean, I've been called insurrectionists, been called a violent mob, been called a coup attempt. Were they terrorists? And, and, and did you see, and people who study this, see signs that this was coming to this point? Uh, a, a lot to unpack there, so I'll, I'll, I'll sort of give you immediate thoughts, and then we can we can you know get into it. Um, it was a terrorist attack, unquestionably. Um, uh, I mean, I'm, I can tell you what my definition of terrorism is, but um, I, I mean, I remember distinctly. I was I was sitting here at my computer, and I have you know the TV news typically on in the background. And on January sixth, um, it was on it was on mute, and I was and I would you know look over and, and see see the event unfolding and, and eventually you know moved from 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 my computer over to the tv and was just like everybody else glued to it it was pretty obvious to me from from um minutes after the attack unfolded that it was that it was terrorism and i know that um people like me would 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 sort of you know get into all kinds of debates around well is it is it terrorism is it insurrection is it you know was it was it a, an attempted coup these things aren't mutually exclusive. My, my worry, however, in, 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 is that in this sort of tangential discussion of what it was, we seem to be missing the bigger, broader implications of it, which is that this, was, this has been a growing threat for many years. And I only hope that if any good comes from what happened on January 6th, it, it is that this threat needs to be dealt with. Right. And... Obviously, you've been following this most recent second impeachment uh, trial against Donald Trump. I mean, every to me, every terrorist group or or movement demands kind of a charismatic leader. Was Donald Trump the leader, at least de facto, of, of this movement, do you feel? Do you feel he's at the center of this? And was it all building to this from his election in 2016? 
I think I think probably earlier than 2016. I mean, extreme right wing activity didn't just just happen when Donald Trump was elected. I mean, this has been a sort of a, there's been an, an, a, a deep insidious undercurrent of this in this country for for many, many years. I think what Donald Trump brought to the table was that he gave these groups meaning and perspective and direction and he gave their actions a sense of urgency. He he presented a I mean even after you know we can go back as far as, as Charlottesville for example where where the fact that he acknowledged them as 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 legitimate I mean that he 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 managed to unify what were otherwise quite disparate and self-serving groups. Trump gave them a sense of urgency and he convinced them um, uh, uh, late last year that unless they acted, um, their way of life was fundamentally uh, 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 forever at risk of being lost. And so, so he, he radicalized, he mobilized, and he incited them to action. There's no doubt in my mind. I have a hard time understanding because it's kind of a diffuse um, movement in a way. You've got different elements, the Proud Boys, certainly the Oath Keepers. But what is your sense of what are they demanding? I mean, I know your early research was in Ireland with the uh, Irish Republican Army and, and other, you know, essentially paramilitary terrorist groups. Um, and I could see, you know, they were angry at a, a British oppression for a long period, but, but what are these groups angry about other than that Trump lost and they didn't want to accept the results of the free and fair election? That's a great question. I think um, and one of my colleagues, I believe it was Colin Clark, said a few weeks ago, uh, these groups do a far better job of, of telling us what they're against than what they're for. And I'm not entirely sure that they know necessarily what they're for. But they came to believe the narrative that, that um, uh, their way of life, America as they believed it, was fundamentally at risk. And, and this is the narrative that Trump and his, and his you know, closest, staunchest, most vocal allies have perpetuated in this country for some time now. Huge contrast, of course, with, with groups like the IRA. Um, uh, you know, terrorism is a, a word that has um, a lot of uh, you know, contentious meaning attached to it. It wasn't a word I heard very often, um, as even, even you know, studying the IRA. Paramilitarism is one of these you know, euphemisms. For groups like the IRA and the so-called uh, old terrorisms, you know, you certainly had a very, very clear sense of what they stood for, what their objectives were, what the sort of their, you know, not, not just the sort of day-to-day -day objectives, but what 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 their objectives, what their broader objectives and goals were. You don't really have a sense of that um, uh, here at all. Um, um, but um, uh, the preservation of of America under the the the, the sort of the division that Trump imparted to them. Um, is essentially what unifies them. It seems underlying too, again, you mentioned euphemisms, uh, that they would never lay claim to this, but I think it's clear there's, there's white supremacy beneath this. And certainly you can parse a lot of Donald Trump's speeches at rallies, clearly more than dog whistles to white supremacists. How much does that feed into this? Um, it's certainly part of it for sure. But but just as as you have white supremacists in these in these in this sort of this 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 coalition, if you like, you also don't have white supremacists. Um, uh, you know, you have misogynists, you have non-misogynists. I mean, there is a um, there is a, there is a very very deep sense of of. Um, um, uh, hostility towards foreigners, for sure. Xenophobia is xenophobia, anti-government sentiment. I mean, these are these are certainly very, very common threads, um, for sure. But it would, but, but it would be it would be inaccurate to to characterize them as as, as sort of motivated by white supremacy. And I think it's part of it, but it, it doesn't nearly capture um, the fact that you've got you've got a whole bunch of things going on here. You know, you certainly have. A sense of a sense of profound grievance. You have um, uh, entitlement. You have um, um, again this belief that 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 America as they envision it, uh, which is a rather strange fundamentalist uh, view of what America ought to be. Um, you have so you have you. I'm struggling even to, to try to characterize it properly, but you have this. Um, 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 complex sort of um, coalescence of, of a bunch of different things coming together that made many of the people in these groups believe at least that they have more in common than, than, uh, than not. My, uh, my colleague Brian Levin described them as 
uh, a sort of you know Second Amendment uh, insurrectionist. So um, right. uh, a, a, a strong belief in the Second Amendment, a strong anti-government um, uh, mentality, xenophobia, and then you have a whole spatter, smattering of, of additional um, elements, if you like, that 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 are are definitely part of who they are, but by by no means define them. Yeah, so we're in a very deep blue state, obviously, you know, New York State, Albany has had a democratic uh, machine um, for 100 years unbroken. But I went to the Trump rally to cover it in 2016. And he had the largest three times bigger than Bernie Sanders, even he had 15,000 people, they were chanting, build that wall, build that wall with with ferocity. And I can drive five minutes from my house here in a suburb of Albany and see Confederate flags, don't tread on me flags. But at the January 6th, the flag they held up the most and that they beat Capitol Police with was the Trump flag. It wasn't an American flag. Is, is this now sort of a movement of Trump? He seems to be, you know, their 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 guru or their leader or something. I can't say. I mean, you know, he, he certainly continues to exercise significant influence. And there's no doubt about it. Um, uh, I mean, my, my, my concern when it comes to, I guess, you know, my small part of this is, you know, has, has to do with the violence and, and right. whether or not that might continue to represent a future direction. Um, what worries me most in, 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 in the week's following January 6th is the fact that the, this so-called the so-called big lie the idea that the election was stolen we still have not seen that being uh, addressed at the level it needs to be addressed and that for me is the fuel that will continue to drive these uh, uh, these individuals and these groups right uh, and I think that 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 is it's, it's part and parcel of the conspiracy that unites them and that is something that that um, you know it's not it's not it's easy to, as an observer and certainly as, a, as, as someone who's not a Trump supporter to look at that and go, well, that's just, you know, it's just nonsense. But to people who, who hang on every single word that Donald Trump said or says, I mean, this is, this is a belief. It is a genuine, legitimate belief that they have that this election was, was illegitimate and was stolen from them. Right. That's and a, I know that's a very, 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 very powerful um, motivator, not just for, you know, the most fringe of Trump supporters to mobilized to action, but it sustains a belief um, um, uh, that, 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 that no good can come from uh, this, this current administration. And that's, right. I think, fundamentally a dangerous thing. You, you've also been writing about Christian nationalism, which seems to me to be a fairly new term, different from far right um, or, or uh, you know, um, far right religion. How do you define that? And and the irony that that this Christian element would espouse violence and be part of this attack on the Capitol. Um, you know, what 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 do they stand for? And how do they square <clears throat> the the teachings of Jesus or whoever they follow with with the call for violence? I don't know that I've written about it, but I, I believe I was interviewed by um, a, a newspaper about that topic. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. so 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 as someone who studies terrorism, I mean, I'm not unfamiliar with people trying to use uh, self-serving interpretations or religious creeds to justify uh, uh, the use of violence. And and that and the the thing about that is that it is, it is it is religiously promiscuous. I mean, we see it across all religions in the same way that I would say, well, no, no true Muslim would engage in violence against fellow Muslims. And well, no true Christian would do the same thing, but it's right. no fundamental difference whatsoever. So let's talk about you. You've, you've done a lot kind of breaking down the mind and the psychology of terrorists. I often, you know, you'll read a story about the mass shootings, which you know, obviously we're at epidemic proportions in the United States. It was often an isolated individual, um, somebody who had, you know, lost uh, social networks or lost jobs and, and was kind of stewing in this anger. Or is some of that similar to the terrorist mind that you've studied or? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, you see all of that and much more uh, besides. Um, uh, one of the most common themes, I would say, in, 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 in looking at not just, you know, comparing different kinds of terrorist groups, 
uh, um, you know, small, big, religious, non-religious, and so forth. But even in some of the smallest groups, there's remarkable diversity. You see, you see different kinds of people getting involved for what initially might look like different kinds of reasons, um, but but after a while and after hanging around with 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 seemingly like-minded people, those differences tend to uh, tend to disappear and they become more similar than different. Uh, some are some carry political baggage with them from the outset. Others are just getting involved because they are at the right place at the right time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they just get caught up in something that they don't necessarily understand, but they feel like, you know what? Yeah, I want to want to I want to see where this goes. Um, so you have ideological people, you have non ideological people, you have men, women, children um, getting involved for what might initially seem like quite diverse reasons. How do you try to conduct your research in addition to monitoring, you know, the online, which a lot of these groups are, are very uh, public in their comments and, and their chatter back and forth. Do you get to the point, the level where you try to infiltrate them? Is any of your work dangerous <laughs> in terms of, you know, have you had any threats or anything that, because of what you study or? Um, uh, I've, I've received threats this past week um, simply by talking about terrorism. I've had people um, uh, email me. I've had people leave threatening messages at my place of work. I've had people contact my, my, my department chair in, in psychology here at Georgia State saying I ought, to be, I ought to be fired, I ought to be deported just for talking about terrorism. Right. Uh, uh, for the most part, um, I haven't received um, um, much by way of threats from terrorist groups themselves. I mean, um, uh, to your question, however, um, we, we sort of, we study terrorism however, however we can. Um, we can certainly, you know, one, so one of the features about terrorism is that terrorist groups produce a lot of material, a lot of propaganda, a lot of, a lot of content for researchers to try to parse through and make sense of. Right. In limited circumstances, it is possible to get access to, to groups. Now, I, infiltration <laughs> is a very, very bad idea. Right. Academics, legitimate academics, do not infiltrate terrorist groups. I think infiltration has sort of connotations of, of doing something untoward or doing something undercover. I mean, that's the kind of thing that the FBI do or right. you know, law enforcement, intelligence services do. We do not do that. Um, what we can do as academics in some circumstances is speak to people who, who were involved or who might be on the margins or who might have um, some role in the terrorist group that might give them access to the public. Um, so if you, you know, I, I cut my teeth in this way back in the day when I had no clue what I was doing. I'm happy to admit that I'm talking to people in the IRA and Sinn Féin, and you could see that some people were, were sort of more involved in the clandestine side of things than others, but you could certainly, back then, you could, you could find out who, who could be approached, you could make a formal request to say, look, I'm a researcher, I would like to talk to you about X, Y, and Z. Um, and, and to an extent, you can certainly still do that. I mean, a number of my colleagues have managed to um, uh, engage via social media with people who have been involved in, in terrorist activity. In fact, that's, that's something I'm gonna be talking about extensively in the next book. But we do not infiltrate. Um, uh, one, of the, um, one of the big, big, big challenges for us is in answering questions about terrorist motivation. You know, so we can look at propaganda, we can look at events, we can give you the what and the how, but for us to understand the why, we have to sit down and talk to people who have, who have gone through this and who have done things. If we exclude people who have left, and, and you know, it's obviously a lot safer for us as academics to talk to people who have left and are no longer involved in terrorism, and, that's, you know, and that, that is also the ethical thing for us to be doing. We also could, if we were allowed, get into the federal prison system and speak to uh, uh, speak to people who've been convicted of terrorist offenses. Paul, I will tell you that I have been asking the Federal Bureau of Prisons for an, over a decade now for um, permission to get into the prisons and do these interviews. Um, yeah. And um, you mentioned, um, you know, at the, at the beginning of the interview, uh, my relationship with the FBI. I am you know, honored and privileged to be able to occasionally consult with the FBI and teach seminars and things like that. 
I have asked the Bureau of Prisons for many, many, many years um, to consider allowing academics like myself in to interview inmates um, in the same way that the FBI were allowed in in the late 1970s to interview serial killers. The kind of knowledge that came from those interviews um, fundamentally changed our understanding of the serial killer. We need to be able to do something similar um, uh, with people who have been involved in terrorism. Yeah, well, I hope they, they let you do that. And, and I, I know you're, um, you're, you're consulting with the FBI. What's your sense when you talk to them? It seems like, you know, and they have given warnings about some of these groups before they hit the flashpoint and explode, but it seems an impossible task to monitor keep under surveillance the amount of you know social media like you say the propaganda that they're putting out do the fbi say that they can't possibly monitor all of it or are they overwhelmed or i don't think the fbi would ever say that even if they believed it um, but but it would be delusional for all of us for any of us really to think that this problem is going to be solved somehow by the federal bureau of investigation i mean the, one of the frustrating things about terrorism is that um, you know, even though we're, it, it's, it's still a rare thing. I mean, you know, it's easy to, it's easy to think that this is a, a sort of an existential problem that, you know, we all have to contend with. You know, it's one of those problems that is, in the words of one of my colleagues, it's overblown. And it's, it's, and it's a problem that's very hard to get some realistic perspective on because it's easy to overstate the risk and it's also easy, and there are consequences, of course, political and otherwise, to understating it. The FBI is a very competent national organization um, that has um, several hundred, if not more now, active investigations ongoing at any one moment in time. The FBI is also very good to go back to the point about infiltration. That is what they do. Right. However, the FBI and other law enforcement agencies rely on the public for, you know, for, for tips and assistance. We've all heard the phrase, you know, if you see something, say something. I mean, it's one of those expressions that I think we tried to get into the to the to the vernacular um, post 9/11. To this day, um, uh, it, you know, relying on tips and 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 um, uh, inform or informants from the general public is critical to early detection when it comes to uh, when it comes to preventing terrorist attacks. Right. Let's also talk about social media you, you mentioned propaganda which is misinformation which is a, a lot of, of what you'll find on the internet you know um and also a small number of people like you you say can can manipulate and amplify and and over you know express how, how important they are or how powerful what do you think that that social media companies the giants like twitter facebook and and others uh, do you think Taking Donald Trump off of that was a was a good idea. I know there's a lot of outrage among his followers, and do you think maybe uh, the tech companies need to um, you know take the megaphone away from some of these groups? Well, I think they do to an extent. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, who who are any of us to tell Twitter and Facebook what to do? I mean, these are commercial entities, and we tend to forget that. You know, we all, we have this sort of we have this terribly naive view of, of what Facebook or, or Twitter ought to do. But when it comes to um, uh, what I would say is incitement to violence, I mean, then, then you know, we wouldn't think twice if someone, if some low level stooge in a, in a random terrorist organization did it, that person would be kicked off instantly. Um, why Trump, you know, got, was allowed to have sort of special privileges because of his position, I mean, was part of the problem here. So, you know, yes, it was a good thing that Trump's um, uh, access to Twitter was taken away because of the dire consequences of what happened on the 6th. Uh, but it would, be, it would be naive for us to think that social media companies are going to just, you know, solve this problem. Part of it, you know, you spoke about misinformation. Part of it, I think, Paul, is that we're going to have to develop far better um, daily habits <laughs> as consumers and users of these platforms because, um, you know, and we're all guilty of this to an extent, but you know the the, the extent to which we 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 circulate and push out information that we don't we haven't necessarily read or, or carefully parsed through. So we're we're all part of the problem, as cliche as it sounds. 
No, I agree. I think it's going to be a, have to be a little bit like our ongoing response to coronavirus. We're all going to have to sanitize more frequently, wear masks, and and social distance from from sites that we are suspect of. I, I agree. That's, that, a perfect, that's a perfect analogy. You know, what, right. why is it that we can't have? Um, why is it that we can't be encouraged or encourage each other to develop better mental hygiene when it comes to um, you know the, the sort of this this terrible um, addiction that we now all have to social media. And of course, all of this is compounded by COVID. There's no question. So, you know, we have a, we have a perfect storm here where, where um, it's, it is admittedly difficult to disentangle uh, ourselves from these uh, platforms that we're also so quick to criticize. Of course, we, we love them, you know, the best of times and worst of times with social media. Um, sure. Now you've been at this, I guess about 20 years, you seem to have 10 or 12 books under your belt. You've got a new one coming up. Sometimes the more you study something, the more <laughs> unsure you are of, of the truths. You feel like you, you've made breakthroughs in understanding, you know, the psychology of terrorism, or is this book, are you re right back at square one, really trying to grasp it? Or do you think you've, you've uh, you know, no 20% more than you did 20 years ago? <laughs> I think I didn't know what I didn't know 20 years ago and 100% and in agreement. I, the more I study this, um, the more, so to be fair, I mean, I'll, I'll sort of be my own devil's advocate here. Um, I definitely think I have a better grasp of it. I think I have become a bit more competent at trying to convey why it is a complex problem and knowing that it's complex is kind of reassuring on the one hand, and on the other hand, it, that, you know, that complexity doesn't do anyone any favors. You know, um, I have this occasional um, privileged position to be able to talk to law enforcement, to be able to talk to people in the intelligence communities and to talk about, you know, what the academic research says about X, Y, or Z. Um, I'm, I'm never ashamed to say we don't know or there isn't enough research on, on, on all of these topics. Um, 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 but do I feel like I understand it a bit more? Um, yes, <laughs> I think I've become a bit more. I mean, I've always been. I've always been a cautious academic, and terrorism is one of those areas where um, it's so complicated, and and you know, no one discipline has a monopoly in the study of terrorism. And you know, my 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 graduate students often get very disheartened when they study it because you know, I tell them, well, look. Yeah, you're a psychologist, but you need to you need to read books on history and political science and criminology and religious studies, and you know, it's a, it's a pretty tall order. Right. So, so, as a psychologist who who tries to make sense of the decisions of people who get involved in, I guess my part of the of the puzzle here is is admittedly very very small, but I think I have I have started to ask better questions. Um, and I think that that for me is probably the, the breakthrough. And, um, you know, uh, this, this, this book that I'm currently finishing um, uh, is in some ways it's an attempt to tell the same story that I've always told, but, you know, it's informed by, you know, newer research, of course, and, and the field of terrorism studies has really come on in leaps and bounds this past decade. But it's also about trying to um, get out of the ivory tower and to talk to practitioners and to talk to, to talk to people in our community to say, look, these are some of the things that we have learned. These are some of the things that we still don't know anything about, um, but, um, but, but here's what we got. So we'll see. And what was the initial impetus in, in addition to your academic work at uh, College Cork? Was your family or close friends uh, impacted or or harmed or or you know killed in the troubles was there anything personal about it to you or nothing nothing personal whatsoever i mean it's a fair fair observation to make i mean ireland is a you know a tiny country um, as you know but no i mean i grew up in Kerry, which may as well have been you know a million miles removed from um um, from from Northern Ireland uh, and 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 the troubles. I mean, I certainly was aware of it growing up. I mean, I would see 
uh, you know, when I was, uh, I guess I must have been nine or 10, 10, I think, you know, I, I remember seeing the aftermath of the, um, the, the, the bombing and the Brighton bombing and the, you know, at the conservative um, um, uh, party uh, conference that year. And I remember, you know, seeing images of people being pulled out of the rubble, but it didn't, I mean, it didn't have an impact on me. I mean, my, neither I nor my family or, or anyone in my circle was impacted by it. Um, the, the, the real interest didn't actually come until I, I did a psychology degree at, at University College Cork. And my then, one of my professors, um, uh, Max Taylor, who is, um, who is a renowned terrorism expert um, and, and a, just a brilliant, brilliant mind, he would come and teach us about psychology, but very often um, um, he, would use, <laughs> he would use terrorism examples to try to illustrate basic concepts in psychology. And I was just fascinated by the idea. I remember, I even remember where I was in the class when I first heard the idea that you don't have to be you know, crazy or disturbed in order to engage in extreme behavior. Right. It often just comes from you know, a thousand little steps and it's that trying to unpack that progression and see it. I was blown away when I heard that. And, and the idea that, um, even the most astonishing cruelty can come from can come from people who um, um, uh, you know you just normally wouldn't associate with that and that that idea really I think just sort of set me on a trajectory and uh, for good or for bad I've never been able to get off it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and looking at your research and just what I've read about these groups, there's obviously something appealing. There's something positive. They build community. You know, they pull them out of the basement to at least, you know, have online chats with people that have similar beliefs and then getting involved in something where you feel totally committed. And then I also want you to talk about, you've done a lot of research about, you know, coming out of those groups. It yeah. reminds me a little bit about the mafia or about Mormons or about other you know, almost brainwashed groups. How difficult is for someone, one, to get into these organizations, terrorist organizations, and then how to get out? Is, is one, is it harder to get out than it is to get in? Or? Uh, we don't know is the answer. Um, we know that uh, there are people who try to get in and can't get in. Um, and there are, you know, depending on the group and depending on the context, um, the group might, you know, close the door on you and say, well, we don't, we don't want people right now, but why don't you stay where you are and try to do something locally? On the other side, and, there, and there's, a whole, there's a whole bunch of issues around you know, the story of getting in and, and what you know, people have in common, and that's a big part of the research right. that we do. On the other side, um, it's only been in the last, I would say, 10 to 15 years that researchers have started to look at people coming out and, uh, and, you know, and the one of the reasons, one of the ways I got interested in that was um, I, I happened to take a real serious interest in Irish affairs around about the time of the first ceasefire in 1994, for ceasefires, plural, I should say. And there were people, you know, I mean, I was, I was fascinated by the fracturing and the disillusionment that was going on in the Irish Republican movement at the time. You had people say, we need, we need breathing space. We need to give this a chance. And, and people who were very much, you know, uh, Adams and McGuinness loyalists who bought into the idea that, look, we can't, can't keep doing this forever. Let's try something different and we'll see what happens. Right. You know, it might not be permanent, but let's give, it a, let's give it a chance. You had others in the same movement who took that as a fundamental betrayal of all that they had sacrificed, all that they had given up, all that they had suffered for over decades and decided forget it i didn't you know i didn't give up everything in order to do this and they and they they saw it as a betrayal and they decided that they wanted to either get out and walk away or in some cases getting out and walking away means 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 starting their own group and developing in some cases as we saw with the with the then real ira there are now multiple real iras um, doubling down to the extent that they were responsible for some of the worst atrocities of the entire trouble so 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 getting out can happen for all different kinds of reasons. Disillusionment seems to be the, the, common, the common factor among and between different sorts of people and different sorts of groups. But getting out can have all kinds of consequences as well. It doesn't necessarily mean that you just walk off to the sunset. It can mean that you, you walk away and you get involved in organized crime, or in some cases you actually, you, you leave for another group. Right. 
so so much focus now obviously in the last month on on domestic homegrown terrorism uh, are you still uh, studying and is there as much research and effort going into you know radicalized islamic jihad terrorism or is that now down the list of of the watch of of you know hot spots and concern and no, 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 not at all. Uh, I mean, I, you know, from a from a research pers researcher's perspective, it's all relevant. Um, uh, I think what often changes are, 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 you know, security objectives and funding priorities. But you know, this is the thing: we ought to be able to to, to walk and chew gum at the same time, as they say. Um, we, you know, some some would say that an overemphasis on the jihadist side of things has led to a failure to see that um, uh, the extreme right wing has been in our rearview mirror, but has been gaining on us for a considerable period of time. Um, it's deeply frustrating to me that we have lost perspective so much on national security issues that, that, it, the, that these issues are often presented as, as, as either or. And this, you know, this sort of um, what aboutism is a sort of, you know, a cynical interpretation of that. But but um, threats come and go, and trends come and go, and they go up and down. But 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 you know, terrorism has multiple faces. It has multiple expressions, and we don't necessarily have any um, a, a, a say or choice in where or when it comes from. But um, there has there have been a lot of, of people like myself and, and my colleagues who specialize, especially in extreme right wing terrorism, who have been ringing this alarm bell for a long, long, long time. Right. And, um, uh, like I say, if any good comes from January 6th from, from the perspective of somebody like myself, it would be that we finally um, spend time, spend the money, spend the resources into really tackling this, this deeply insidious problem. And what practical, like for the average person, you mentioned a, a couple, you know, we need to be better consumers of news and not spread misinformation and propaganda. There's already people who are lamenting these security fences going around the Capitol. It's not like it used to be. It's not a good symbol for a democracy. Obviously, airports are hardened now. We didn't used to have to go through metal detectors and take off our shoes and what are some practical things that you think that you'd like to see put in place that that average people could do to, to you know, be part of the solution rather than part of the problem? I can think of about 50 million things we need to do right now. And, and I'm, I'm having conversations all this week. I'm speaking to uh, congressional staffers uh, in the next 48 hours about um, um, ideas for informing um, um, security responses and, and national security strategy writ large and how research can, can, can inform or challenge or otherwise um, uh, be part of that process. Practical advice right now, Paul, honestly, I would say we, we need to take a deep breath and learn to have basic conversations with people with whom we disagree. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, 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 at the risk of making it sound trite and cliche, I think we have we have some big picture issues that involve small steps on all, all our part. So so certainly being better consumers of, of, of social media and media in general, um, but but learning to have conversations again. Um, like I say, we have we have somehow lost the fine art of having a conversation, let alone the even finer art of having strong disagreement with people um, uh, with you know whose views we don't. Uh, 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 agree on. And that's, you know, whether it's about middle ground, I don't know, but we need to somehow find common ground, um, uh, at least, and be willing to, to have those conversations. And I, on so many levels, still don't see a willingness for us to do that. Yeah, I, I agree. That's part of this rebuilding the Republic. We're trying to at least have a dialogue, and we do have people across the spectrum of of ideas and opinions, but we really appreciate making the time um, for us. Uh, I know you're in high demand. Uh, looking forward for your book next year, Terrorist Minds. Uh, we've been uh, here today with John Horgan. He's the uh, distinguished professor at uh, Georgia State University. Thank you so much for spending time with us, John. Pleasure is all mine. Let's do it again. Thanks so yes. much. Thank you very much.